Hello and welcome to Bastionland Broadcasting, where we are going to be talking about role-playing games and talking about difficulty in role-playing games, but I'm going to be completely transparent about tonight's stream. Um, from sort of spring last year, um, I have be I've been self-employed since then, um, and as we got to the start of this year, I sat down and I thought, you know what I've not really done since going self-employed is I've not really had a day off. And I get that that's like a thing when you're self-employed. You don't really have holidays in the same sense. And obviously it's been a very strange year. So there's not been, it's not like I've been flying around the world um, <laughs> like I normally would, um, taking long holidays. But it's... Um, I decided that I'm going to have a few days off this week. So today is technically a day off. So if you think that I've been like half arsing the um, the stream before now, um, just wait and see um, how tonight goes because I'm going to be playing through a game that exemplifies something I want to talk about when it comes to role playing games. So I wanted to talk a little bit about difficulty in role-playing games and what makes the different types of difficulty basically now as always i have to give the disclaimer of when i'm playing a video game and talking about tabletop role-playing games um there's always the um there's always the fact that things aren't going to match up perfectly so something that's an example of good design in a video game might not be transferable to a tabletop game but I'm trying to look at like overall principles here. Um, I'm being told that the sound is a little bit low. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump very quickly to the intermission. And I'm going to try and fix that quickly so we can have good sound tonight. So bear with me. Okay, that's the best I can manage without restarting the stream. So we'll see how we get on with this. Um, but I'm going to jump over to the game that um, I wanted to talk about. Um, so it's a game that's been out for some time now um, and I played it at launch um, a fair bit and got, I, I didn't get to the end but I got like nearly to the end um, and this is a game called Celeste and like I say, it's you'll see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just like jump into the game and start playing because you'll see what's going on. Um, I've had to like reinstall this on my PC so I don't have all of the progress that I've done on the Switch. Um, but I'm going to show you what I mean about this game and then I will uh, start to talk about what does all this have to do with um, role-playing games, like tabletop games, and why Why am I showing this as an example. Um, so really, when I'm talking about difficulty um, in games, there's a few things I'm talking about um, that are quite specific to role-playing games, but I do think there is a fair bit of crossover with um, with general sort of game design that applies to, to video games as well. Um, so Celeste is a platformer. Um, you, you can jump, you can grab, and you can climb up and down, but you have stamina. That means you will eventually get tired and start to fall. And you have a dash that you can do in any direction you like. Just one dash. And when you do it, your hair goes blue and you know that your dash is gone. So you have quite a simple set of tools um, at your disposal. Oh, we, we need to we need to have the um we need to have the sound on, Celeste for sure. There we go. I'll have that nice and quiet so you can still hear me. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not here to review Celeste. I think it's uh, a fantastic game. If you got the itch bundle for racial equality, it's in there. So that's how I ended up with like a spare copy of it because I bought that bundle and um, I already had it on the Switch. But seeing it there made me think I could talk about this. So it's it's a platformer. It's, you, you know, you've seen it a thousand times before. Try and get across the room. Try not to touch the spikes because they'll kill you. 
it's it's nothing um, particularly groundbreaking in that regard. And there are no shortage of platformers out there that are these kind of um, like super hardcore difficult uh, platformers. Um, you know, things like Super Meat Boy, we looked at N++ uh, some months ago now and that, that has elements of this kind of genre. Um, yeah, like Remain says, it's very popular with speedrunners. It's, it's that kind of game. It's like, this is the, this is like the sec, well, there's a, there's a tiny little tutorial and this is like the first world. So everything's very basic, but it does get difficult later on. Um, but the thing that I noticed with this game, because I, I'm not a huge fan of like really difficult games. I, 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 I did enjoy like Super Meat Boy and plus plus, but things like, things like Dark Souls, I guess, being the classic example. And um, I tried to get into Cuphead because I really enjoyed the art style, but I just couldn't get into the gameplay. And I couldn't work out, I was thinking like, well, why, why do I find this difficult game works for me and this other difficult game uh, doesn't? Um, and I did enjoy Dark Souls, but I didn't, I had to work at it very hard and it was, um, it didn't grab me in the same way and I always felt like I was fighting against it. So. I've made like a little list of things that I think make Celeste work in ways that some of those other games don't work for me. As always, I'm going to give the disclaimer, this is my opinion, and you may hate this game, and you might love Cuphead, and that's absolutely fine. Like, I'm not saying that this is a, a better game. Um, but, <laughs> for whatever reason, it works for me. And we're going to look at how some of those reasons could potentially translate over to to role-playing games, um, whether you're running them or designing them. Um, so one thing that I think kind of sums up why why Celeste feels like a fair challenge to me is a phrase that uh, I've seen this phrase like knocked around in other other wordings. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim to have invented this particular wording now. Um, I, I really don't think I did invent this. Uh, and it's it, it comes down to don't make the game difficult. Make the world difficult. So with Celeste, there's not much to learn in the way of controls. Like I say, you, you, you can grab with the trigger. You can jump with one button. You can dash with the other button. And that, that's kind of it. There's no, there's no run button, I don't think. Do you do a double dash run? I can't, I can't remember. No, I don't think you do. Um, there's no weird, I'm, I'm sure there are, sorry, weird tricks that speedrunners can do. But for just like getting through the game, there's no, there's no fancy tricks that you need to learn to begin with. So the idea is when you die in this game, it should feel like you've been killed by the world of the game. You've died because the story of this game is you're trying to climb this mountain. And, you know, the character is having doubts about whether or not uh, she can climb the mountain. And, you know, it's, it's this challenge. So it should feel like a challenge where you're, you're cursing the mountain rather than cursing your own your own means of interacting with the mountain if that makes sense at all so yeah when playing this game i there, there were times when i was like this level's bullshit and it, it's too hard but it was that it was never a case of me saying this game is bullshit and like things don't work the way that i expect um so i'm going to progress a little bit further while i talk i have done this level earlier today just to like reacquaint myself um the other thing that this game does really well, I'm going to jump around the list slightly, is uh, optional challenges. So the main goal is just to get to the top of the mountain, but then there are these optional challenges, which are these strawberries, and there's like um, cassette tapes, I think. My, my memory's a bit foggy. Um, there's extra things you can get that are completely optional, but you don't have to go and like select, I'm going to now go play the optional difficult mode. I mean, I'm lying. There, there is something to that effect. But even in the standard game, there are these extra challenges that you can just decide 
to go and do. So I've already got this strawberry, but that's an extra one. Um, but getting back to this idea that it's the world that kills you, it's not the game. Um, it's a tough one to bring over to tabletop role-playing games because so much of it in video games comes down to the controls. Now, I know that there's been like a million essays written about Dark Souls controls and the fact that the control is very weighty and arguably it can feel kind of sluggish at times and like you can feel like you're fighting the controls of your character. Um, whereas here you've got a character that's very responsive. But I think there's one thing in this game that really, really puts it puts it into practice for me. Um, and that is... That is something um, that I can show you now. So, how many times have you been playing a platform game and you run to the end and you don't jump uh, quickly enough and you fall off the edge to your death? Let, let's find some spikes so I can do this fairly. So you run and you don't press jump until too late because you're trying to get that really long jump. <clears throat> In Celeste, when you jump, you can see, see like a little... Uh, dust cloud sort of thing appears at my feet when I jump well if you watch you can walk a good like two steps off the edge and st still jump and it's little things like that that make it feel like this the game system is on your side um, and you're fighting this common enemy of the mountain. Um, you're not fighting the controls of the game system. You're just fighting the mountain, which is exactly what's happening in the kind of the narrative of the game as well. Um, right, this is a slightly more <laughs> tricky one. So let's go. So, the good thing is, that's an optional challenge room. Oh, we've spoken to that guy already. Um, so yeah, it, it it feels like you're you're working together almost against the mountain. Now, how does that relate to role playing games? Well, there was a blog post years and years ago that I remember reading that was something to the effect of um, it was related to kind of like old school, like sandbox style play where you've got you've got monsters around that are far too difficult for the players to just be able to take on. So the classic example is like you're playing like a BX um, basic like D&D dungeon and you put like a purple worm on the first level. So it's some monster that's far too difficult for the players to just go and kill in a straight combat and this post was kind of like talking about things like that and it came up with the idea that uh it should always feel like when the players when the player character dies the player doesn't feel like the gm killed them they feel like the dire wolf killed them and that kind of that attitude really freed me up to start thinking about how I thought about what monsters are suitable to put in the game. So with things like Into the Odd, um, in the kind of the sample dungeon that's in there, there's very consciously a, an equivalent to a purple worm in that starter dungeon that's far too difficult for the players to be able to kill straight up. And just having that confidence to put that in there um, and just making the world feel like it's the world that's against you and not the GM. Now, it relies a lot on GM trust and that's why when I wrote Electric Bastion Land, there's like 100 pages of GM advice and, and talking about how to like, how to make the players trust you and feel like it's a fair game. But that's a, that's a different topic for another day, I think. Um, but that's just something to bear in mind. Um, there are a few other things that this game does um that i think really help make the difficulty feel feel right um yeah so skull in the chat 
He's saying about how it's very different controls to Mario. So I'm thinking of like Mario Super Mario Brothers 1 or like Super Mario World. Um, so much of that game is about like running and building up momentum. Whereas here like um, Madeline, the character, you can just like turn her on the spot and she can dash from like 0 to 100 like it's nothing. And there's there's no... Is there a run? For, for a second I was like... Was, was, is there a run button? I'm really glad there's not a run button because again, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say this is like an improvement over <laughs> Super Mario Brothers or anything like that, but I think it achieves what it set out to do and it lets you have these super precise um, super precise challenges and they do feel there's, there's fewer times when you just plow off to your death because of momentum. Now watch me die because of momentum here because this is like a specific momentum based challenge as I was talking about that. Um, but yeah, it's it's worth playing. If you've got uh, the bundle for racial equality, then you already own this game. I, I thought this was a different part where I had to hold on to that. I won't lie. Um, it's great. And I've, I've uh, messed this up. Yeah. But again, it's that holy grail of when I die, I'm blaming myself. Um, the other thing that it does, which is not entirely applicable to, um, to tabletop role playing games, is when you do inevitably die like that. Um, you're back like a second later and you're here there's no there's none of that Super Mario Brothers uh, stop the music stops you get an embarrassing death animation the screen goes black and then you go back to the beginning of the level you're you're straight back here you you may have lost some progress on the screen but largely you're gonna be there and there's no there's no lives counter you just try again now, I was thinking about this a lot, and I was thinking, like, well, how, how does this relate to role-playing games? And the obvious thing is something else that I did with, like, Electric Bastion and then especially Into the Odd was um, if you're going to have a potential for character death, uh, then when the character you should have something in there for what happens when the characters die. Because it's all well and good running, I don't know, Pathfinder, and saying, right, I'm going to run a Pathfinder game, and there's a real, but I want it to be deadly, so there's a real chance that the uh, player characters are going to die. But when they die, if they have to go and then make another character, and, you know, making a character in a system like that can be a process that takes a long time, um, that can be a problem. So with Into the Odd, it's very much, it's a, I think, you, I remember doing this challenge so many times, but like you can roll a character in a minute easily. Um, if, if you're like speed running the character creation but realistically three four minutes to, to make a new character and it, it's a rule in the book that says when a character dies get that player back into the game as soon as possible and you should favor quickness over realism so it's no use saying well we're we're four floors into this dungeon so how are we going to find a way for this character to come in it's unrealistic for there to just be like a random person hanging around in the dungeon and yeah if that's the way you want your game to be then I guess more power to you but actually no I think we're all here to play the game just get them back in it's it's simple as that really now this is an optional challenge that I've not done yet so let's so this is bad so with these strawberries uh, optional challenges that you can do but you don't get the strawberry until it until you get back on solid ground basically so um, I'm in a bit of a bad place yeah <laughs> and this is the thing it's it's a challenge but you can you can try it and then you can yeah, I feel like I need to get on there without using my dash Hmm. 
I will now go silent for about two minutes while I try this. Oh, there we go. Okay, and then you go there. Ah, no. Right, bollocks to this. Well, um, <laughs> I'm not going to sit and make you watch me fail at this strawberry challenge all night. I know I could have done it. That's all that matters. Um, so, yeah. Optional challenges are fun, but, yeah. I was thinking about this whole fail state in role-playing games and different ways to handle it. Because, yeah, one way is just to have the player create a new character and come back in. Um, but... Ah, I forgot that these ones with wings, they... Sorry, when you first see them, if you use the dash, it scares them away. So it's adding like another constraint to this extra challenge. Um, so yeah, ha having like quick character creation is one way to make death less of a thing. Less of a problem, rather. So the other way of doing it is to take death off the table and... Again, there's been a million posts about this, so I won't go into it too much. But the whole fail-forward idea. The idea that you're removing the penalty of death in some sense. Because even if you even if you fail, even if you fail dramatically, then you will... Um, things will still progress forward. So you still advance the game. So even if your character isn't having a great time, the, um, the player is still... The player is still enjoying the game. And that's the thing. It's much in the same way as you want the you want the world to be the thing that kills you rather than the game. Um, you want to punish the characters sometimes, but I don't think you ever really want to punish the players. And that, you know, that's not me saying no consequences for death. That's me saying... If there are consequences for death, the player should still be having a good time, even if they're failing. Failure doesn't have to mean you're removing the fun from the game. Ah. Right, we're going to speed run to the end of this level now. I think I'm relatively near the end. This was a bad idea. Oof, wow. That's one way of doing it. Um, Hoaxfish asks, have I heard of Coyote Time? Yes, that's the, that's the principle I was trying to explain. I couldn't remember the name for it. I knew there was one. So it's like when Wally Coyote runs off the cliff and then stops in midair and realises he's he's not got any ground below him. Um, oh, that was a little bit too far. Um, there's a very generous amount of Coyote Time in Celeste. So it, it's, it's not a unique thing to Celeste. Um, I think most platformers do it to an extent. Um, but Celeste feels especially generous in that regard. And it's another thing that I've started to like... I, I don't know if this is new. I, I don't know if this comes across in Electric Bastion Land uh, when I talk about how I run the game. But I've always struggled with this... One of the Apocalypse World um, principles or something like that is uh, be a fan of the players. I'll be a fan of the player characters, sorry. And I think that can, much, much like all of the Apocalypse World um, principles and uh, things like that and agendas, uh, it can be interpreted in a number of ways and debated at length. But um, I've I've always been a bit like, uh, that, that's one of the ones that I, I struggle with. I don't find it as compelling. But um, one principle that I do use, which is kind of similar, is if in doubt... Um, if in doubt, favour the players. And that's exemplified quite well by this whole Coyote time thing. It's like the game is saying, look, you you were close enough, I'll let you have it. Um, now, it's a fine line. Um, you don't want to seem arbitrary. But if it does come down to it, if a situation comes down to like, I have to make a call one way or the other, I will generally favour the players. Because what is there to be lost, really? I mean... The classic example is in Initiative. Again, I'm talking about Into the Odd a lot um, because it was it was in there first. Um, this idea with Initiative was 
if in doubt, the the players go first before before the enemies. So you kind of like assume that they're getting to act first, and yeah, it's not fair on the monsters, but they are the players, you know. They, they, they do need to be treated slightly differently to the monsters. So we've made it to this section. Um, I hope that's been useful to some extent. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to try and play a little bit more of the next level because, to be honest, it's been a long time since I played it and I just fancy, fancy playing the game for a minute. And, like I say, this is technically my day off. So um, while I'm doing that, if you're in the chat and you have any questions about anything to do with anything, I'm happy to answer because we're just going to chill out and play a bit of Celeste. Um, yeah, Salo Ghost talks about paranoia. Um, so in paranoia, your character, you have, there's like clones of your character that you can uh, that you can bust out. Sorry, I got I got confused by the menu for a second. Then, so we're going to this new 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 level. Um, yeah, in Paranoia, they just had like backups of your character, and that can work. I played. Um, I remember one of the more memorable games that I played was um, this. It's going to sound like old G plus name dropping, but it was uh, one of the old. Uh, we used to have like maybe annual meetups with like some of the G plus. RPG people um, that were based in the UK and we met up in Manchester to play some games I think there was myself James Young was running the game um, Patrick Stewart was there David Black who else was there? Uh, th there were a number of people there um, I think we had something stupid like 12 12 players or something so James had offered to run like this this killer dungeon that he'd made and he just straight up gave us like three three clones of each character and it worked because it was a, it was a silly one shot where we were just trying to get through these traps and some of the traps were completely like the opposite of what i would call a good trap like some of them were just like gotcha traps um but that was that was the game oh right now i remember something about these I'm assuming I'm going to get to the bottom and uh, trigger something that's going to wake these up. I mean, aside from anything like, aside from even if you're not interested in learning about role-playing games, <laughs> like, it is just an absolute joy to control this game. Right, we're getting we're getting plots now. So Romaine asks, um, you probably answered this question a million times. I don't know if I have. I've I've I've, I've definitely spoken about this thing before. Um, but Romaine asks, um, how did you come up with removing the attack roll in Into the Odd and Bastion Land? Um, oh, okay. Um, so, I, I, the, the answer I used to give was that I found a blog somewhere that talked about removing the attack roll from, sorry, the, like the to hit side of the roll, removing that from D and D. And I think this is probably talking about. I think this might have been like before fifth edition so i don't know if this was talking about third edition or something um and it was just on some blog that i can't remember the name of um i've since gone back and tried to find this blog and i just can't find it anywhere um but someone was talking about it and it was um the principle was that you could remove the attack roll from D, &D and they, they they tried it out as a bit of an experiment and they said yeah this this kind of works but um, 
but yeah, I'm going to see if I want to do anything else with it. And then I looked through the latest posts and they hadn't done anything with it. So they just kind of done it as an experiment. And then, for whatever reason, didn't go any further with it. So, at the time, Into the Odd was using kind of something similar to what, like, the Black Hack does. Or I guess, I guess Troika, to be fair, is kind of similar. I mean, obviously that's based on fighting fantasy. But uh, this idea of having both sides in a combat role and the winner the winner hits the loser, basically. So it's an opposed role in combat and whichever side wins hits the other side. So yeah, I think the Black Hack uses it and, um, and Troika potentially. But it, it felt a bit too like heroic for what Into the Odd was becoming. Because I didn't want Into the Odd to be a game about combat. I wanted combat to be something that could happen. But it wasn't something that was to be encouraged. And lots of games, you know, talk the talk about this. And say, oh yeah, combat is a last resort. But I wanted to really make this super clear and say, look, if you go and fight, then you will, you will probably get hurt. You better have a plan. But similarly, you know, it goes both ways. You might get hurt, or rather you will get hurt, but so will, ah, I forgot about these. But so will your enemies. So there's none of this, um, I can't remember what these things are for. Uh, there's none of the, um, there's none of this roll to miss. Something happens every turn um, for the most part and and yeah, it was it was just something. As soon as I tried it, I had to tweak it a bit to make it work with like HP and everything, and how how recovering HP works. That's that's kind of the big one that that allows the whole system to work. And um, and yeah, so it, so the the short answer, I guess, is it came from some blog post that I I have looked for since I've done. I've made a genuine effort to find this person. Um, but where, wherever they wrote it, I can't find it. Um, so they are forever going to be just somebody that I have to say, oh yeah, someone else came up with this idea. And um, ah, there we go. Someone else came up with this idea and I, I kind of took it and ran with it, but I don't know who it was. But yeah, it, again, I, I'm sure I've told this story a million times, but my first experience with D&D &D was... Um, I'd played some other things like one well, fantasy roleplay, briefly dabbled, but like my first proper D and D was third edition, and I remember trying out combat like with a friend after we'd got the books, and like literally the the first attack was like an orc. So I think like we attacked the orc, missed, and then the orc attacked us. I can't remember if it was my character or my friend's character and rolled like a 20 and got their critical hit and whichever weapon it was that orcs came with in, in third edition D&D &D, they um oh, I've been here sorry going around in circles um whichever weapon it was orcs had did like extra critical damage I think it was like three times critical damage so they ended up like one shotting a character and I've got no issue with characters dying in one hit but it was the the swingy nature of it that I never liked. I think it always just felt always just felt off to me. Uh, Skullboy asks um, I like baddies doing a capture and ransom in lieu of death for characters sometimes with the idea that since a lot of old school adventure is based around treasure finding you can deal out a fee for getting a character back instead of having to bother killing anyone. Yeah, um, there's a post Oh, what's the blog called? Wampus Country, I think. I haven't checked this blog in ages. I think, I, I apologies, I, I forget the name of the writer of the blog. I know I, I followed them for, for a long time, but I can't remember their name uh, right now. And um, yeah, Wampus Country is, is a really interesting blog. Um, it's a very kind of, very kind of specific, like old school D&D &D campaign based around like Americana folklore. 
kind of thing, like lots of river boats and like rare rabbit sort of thing almost. Um, and they had a post on that blog that was called It Gets Worse. And the whole principle was rather than dying, if you get to a point where your character would die, as a GM, because you know, this was this kind of almost like fairy tale style setting. Instead, you describe a way that it gets worse. And the example I remember is like you're rather than being killed, like this giant bird carries you off and you're now in the nest of this bird. Or you get captured and put in a cauldron. Um, so it's always a case that it gets worse, which I, I think, I guess, is really just fail forward under a different term. But this certainly predates me hearing about fail forward. So yeah, that kind of stuff's really cool. Um, Salagos says, I'm not sure if combat should be a last resort. I think it should always be regarded as a risky resort. Yeah, this is it. I mean, I'd be a hypocrite if I said that like combat was meant to be entirely discouraged because a lot of the rules are about combat and you know characters start with weapons and I, I can't think of many games of Into the Yard or Electric Bastion Land that I've had where combat has never been like considered as an option um, but I just didn't want it to be the absolute default so again without without naming names of systems there's certain systems where like you look at the character classes and um, they're just like written purely from a combat perspective and you know if, if it's a combat game it's a combat game that's fine but um, it's just not what I wanted for this system I'm doing a bad job of navigating this level while talking Eric Jensen yes hoax fish sorry Eric Jensen is the uh, the author of um, Wampus Country I've not checked that blog in a long time so I don't know what's going on with that or what's going on with Eric at the moment so um, that's my disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, Salago says another thing about the swinginess of combat in D&D is down to HP being a non-factor with a big breakpoint at 1 slash 0. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind the sort of abstract nature of HP. Like, I've kind of made my peace with it, really. Um... The fact that you don't like get injured um, there we go uh, yeah the fact that you don't get injured um, in D&D really you just kind of you're fine and then you're fine and then you're dead I don't mind that I think it, I think it's a it's a less than perfect system but I don't know if there is a perfect system um, with Into the Odd I was glad that I was able to bring you know the, the sort of like the strength loss into it is kind of a, a factor but to be honest even losing strength is basically just like losing hp because strength isn't really used in the same way as it is in D, D. and i didn't want to have a death spiral in there so um so yeah i i, I see what you mean about like the binary nature of like you're fine or you're dead but i do think with injuries you have to be careful because there's the whole like the, the classic story about warmer fantasy roleplay is you play your character until they get so beaten up that you kind of want the character to die because they just can't really do anything. Ah, right, I wasn't paying attention. Am I running away from this uh, <laughs> shadow of myself? I remember it actually having a pretty uh, compelling story as well, which um, I'm normally very quick to... Um, ignore the story in games like this but I remember being quite uh, quite taken with this one right I'm gonna concentrate while this is going on because this looks pretty uh, pretty full-on and uh, yeah I, I may be wrong but from what I remember, I don't think there's, like, bosses in this game. Because there's not really enemies that you have to jump on their heads, as far as I remember. Um, so the closest thing to a boss battle you've got here is, um, you know, a platforming race. So it's like a, an actual platforming boss. 
Oh shit, this this is gonna be this is gonna be too much for me to like answer questions and play this game at the same time. Um I will try, but I'm gonna be prioritizing the questions, so don't judge me for my gameplay here. Ah Right, I'm gonna have one more one more serious try at this and then I can see I can see there's a question in the chat. I'm <laughs> waiting for an answer. Right. Right, okay. Um, Jay Waffles says, um, do you have techniques for when you realize mid-game that an encounter is too much, or sorry, when an encounter is much more difficult than you intended without seeming like you're pulling punches or being arbitrary? Uh, yes. So, I, and there's people that will say like you should never ever fudge a die roll because it ruins like the integrity of the game i'm sure i've probably done it at some point and i think it depends on how serious you want to be with your game and like how how strict you want to be on yourself i think in theory i agree with that idea that i agree with the idea that you shouldn't fudge the die rolls because failure should still be interesting. Right, I'm, I'm going to stop trying to play this game while I answer the questions. So, um, so yeah. Um, open roles, you've got on to mention. I, I think if you get partway through an encounter and either um, the dice have like gone completely against the players and they're they're really struggling and they're they're close to dying, or the players realise that this encounter is actually much more difficult than they had anticipated. I think the last thing you should do is then like soften that encounter. I think as long as they realise the danger they're in, they will like act accordingly and they need to accept, you know, it's good to set the expectations that it's okay to run and it's okay to surrender or to just like try and escape from this monster. Um, it's not a case of like fight to the death all the time and um, I think if you've got those expectations in place then you don't need to worry about it too much the real problem is when the players don't realize how much danger they're in and that's where traditional like D&D style combat can struggle because you might not know how much damage the monster does that the monster might like miss its attacks on the first three rounds of combat and the players are thinking oh we've got this under control and then it can hit and it can use whatever weird special ability it has and suddenly things go against the players. So I, I'm i not going to go on about information because I know that I've done that a lot before, but I will give the players as much information as I can reasonably give them about the encounter and about the danger that they're in and just telegraphing that danger. And I probably go too far sometimes and like make things too obvious, but um, I would rather that than have the players not realize the danger they're in i hope that makes sense right ah see i've not played this game for a long time but I'm not saying I'm doing well. I feel like I'm doing well considering that I'm uh, also trying to uh, <laughs> to talk at the same time. I can't really do two things at once. Um, but this game does just make you feel like you're incredible. Right, we're nearly there. I can, I can feel it. Ah. And yeah, I, I will always roll in the open because, I, well, I say that there's the only times that I wouldn't roll in the open is when I want there to be like some mystery about things. But I think you have to be very careful about those situations. So I might do it if it's like, oh, is there a, is there a wandering monster nearby? 
and I might roll that in secret just to like make them feel like they're in a dangerous environment. But I also just like getting players to make those rolls because I would never hide a roll so that I could potentially so that I could then go on to like fudge the result and change the result because if if you can't handle all the results on the dice then either you're using a using the wrong die or you shouldn't be rolling at all like you're rolling the die because you are wanting the input of that randomness i've done the exact same thing twice there so this is an example of where coyote time does not work because <laughs> when you drop off one of these platforms you actually don't have much time to make your jump so let's do this now close music is fading and I mean I've not talked about the level design of this game but like it is also a bit of a masterclass in level design because each level just introduces like one new little thing. But for the most part, it's a new thing that like feeds off like the basic mechanics. So that that special sort of starry areas are all based on the dash here. So, people talking about like fudging HP total, so like lowering the HP of a um, of a monster after after the combat has begun. Now, I have done that before. <laughs> I've definitely done that, and I've done that in times when, with Electric Bastion and or Into the Yard, I've fallen into the trap of giving a monster too much. Too much armor seems to be the thing that has sometimes made combat a bit slow. So my advice, if you are running Electric Bastion and or Into the Odd, is to be very careful with armor. I, For monsters, I'd rather give like a weird invulnerability. Oh. So uh, make the monster like invulnerable to normal weapons, perhaps. But... Um, but, but give them like a way around that. So again, in Into the, in into the Odd, I was reading Into the Odd this week. Um, with Into the Odd, there was um, the sample monsters that are in the book. There is one that's just like a big sack of armor and HP, but it's like a giant turtle. So it kind of makes sense. The players know that going in. But for other monsters that I wanted to be scary, like I think the, the Dust Witch... Um, I think normal attacks against her are like impaired so she's a real pain to attack but you can like throw water on her to cause like massive damage and um, I prefer that kind of monster to just like something that soaks up a load of damage unless it makes sense like unless it's just a real big thing right we are reaching something of a natural conclusion here to the stream um, thank you everyone for your questions and as always, thank you for watching. I think we will uh, we'll leave Celeste there for tonight. Um, and yeah, as always, you can find out more about this. Um, find out more about what's happening with Electro Bastion and Into the Yard, things like that, um, on bastionand.com. Um, the posts on bastionand.com are supported by uh, the Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash bastionand. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at bastionand. Uh, you can watch these videos on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash bastionand. So if you can think of a website and put bastionand after it, it's probably pretty safe. So um, 
until next time there will be a bastion on broadcast next week um i have one idea for something that would be kind of productive and one idea for something that would just be silly so if you want to let me know which of those you prefer you can get in touch with me on twitter there is also the bastion and discord server um if you're not on there already all of this is on bastionand.com um but until then uh thank you for watching and good night